Thank you, Tracy, for your work and for your ministry to our children. A word of thanks to all those who showed up last, uh, last week to help uh, with the setup for our coffee house, or for our coffee house, for our yard party. How many came out and helped out in that? Slip your hands up. Wonderful. If you can come out again, it would be great. I mentioned uh, a week ago, Pastor John was here all by himself setting up, and then, then he had help because Anthony sh showed up and gave a hand. And, uh, you know, and I, I just wanted to pause and say thank you uh, to the young men that come out, Anthony and all those guys. They are honestly amongst our best workers within the church. Amen? They have done a lot in this building. I've seen them up on scaffolding, putting these on. I've seen them uh, doing the, the lights up here, up higher than any man should go in this building. Uh, I don't know, were you guys up when we did this one in the center? Any of you guys? You were, it was you and me, Peter. Aaron, that's, that's the reason you have no hair left. They turned the fan on and Peter was up there. He had a full head of hair before that. <laughs> <laughs> it's Peter and Aaron and uh, <laughs> Aaron he avoided the fan thank goodness eh? <laughs> bless the Lord how many have had a good week wonderful wonderful I had a good week this week I, uh, I was in uh, Sussex for the last couple of days um, went up with the superintendent to uh, go to a um, a seminar on church growth. Uh, Paul Borden was there, and uh, he is um, he is kind of the name uh, when it comes to uh, church interventions, taking churches that have been dying and then turning them around. And um, we have a lot of dying churches in the Maritimes, a lot of dying churches in the Pentecostal assemblies, and. Uh, there really needs to be intervention in our churches and our churches need to turn around from being dying churches to growing churches. Because I believe that God's will for every church to be a growing church, a Great Commission church. Anybody agree with me in that? Every church should be reaching the lost. Hallelujah. God bless you. There's Florence back there. I know you were here last week. I didn't see it, but I noticed you this week. God bless you guys. Good to see you here. Uh, when we talk about our church, we say at Evangel we are. What does that mean when we say we're growing together? Can you give me a couple of answers? Anybody? Outreach, okay? Evangelism. What else can it mean? Growing together. Growing together spiritually. Yes. What else can it mean? Yeah, growing together as a family, and, and so that we are a, a close-knit family that support one another and love one another. Fellowship, that ties in with that, that family, that fellowship, that support of one another, of caring. Anybody else? Praying for each other, there's a good one. Uh, and and uh, we could talk, tie that into, uh, that's partly into the discipleship that, uh, of, of growing as believers, as we grow as believers, that, that prayer life grows and uh, the fellowship with, in Christ is not just that we get together like the Kinsman Club or the Lions Club or the, the Water Buffalo Club, Fred Flintstone fans. Uh, it's, it's that we get together and it's centered around Christ. Eating together. Eating together is important. And if you can't eat together, you can't do anything. In fact, you know, uh, if you study the book of Acts and read it closely, a lot of it has to do with eating together. You find them breaking bread and having fellowship, and then, then we find that uh, I'm getting a little bit of a ring. I don't know if you, can you guys hear that out there? There's a little bit of a ring. So if, if uh, some of you guys can work on that and try to get that out, and it may be just the way that my mic is on. Um, but uh, when we talk about growing together, this is what I mean. And today I want to talk about our vision for the church, where we're going as a church. It's important to know where a church is going. How many agree with that? 
It's important. It's important to know where, where the, the, the leadership is taking the church. Um, we have a new boarder with us, Maria, and she's back at back. I'll embarrass her. And her and Jenny both live with us, and, uh, and uh, there are two boarders. And uh, this week, Maria arrived, and Jenny was teaching her about buses. She comes from Lockport, and I don't know if there's a lot of buses in Lockport other than school buses. I don't think so. But uh, uh, she was teaching her how to get on the 59 and then how to shift to the, f the 61 and, and where the 73 goes and where the 63 goes and, and all this because she's attending the, uh, the community college down the waterfront. And um, it's important that you're on the right bus. How many agree with that? If you want to go someplace in the city, you can't just get on any bus. Uh, we get a couple of bus drivers. You can't just get on any bus. You have to get on the right bus because if you get on the wrong bus, you just don't end up where you want to go. And I want to talk a little bit t today about where I see this bus evangel going. And our theme has been, we are growing together. When I say we are growing together, I mean three things. Number one, that we are growing together spiritually. We got all three of them this morning. I, that was really well. So somehow we are communicating what we are meaning when we say we're growing together. I'm, I'm really happy with that. When we say we're growing together, we first of all mean we're growing together spiritually. That means discipleship. That it's God's will that we would become His disciples. That we're growing together socially. That means we're growing together as a family and in fellowship. And the third way is we're growing together numerically, which means evangelism. That we want to see lost people come to Christ. That is the basics of what we mean when we say that we're growing together. And it sounds like you folks have it already, so I could probably stop now and we could go home and have an early lunch, but I'm not going to. I take it though the hand clap was because I said I'm not going to. <laughs> I'll cook tonight, there you go. And uh, so you can come here for lunch or for supper anyway. Um, what are God's favorite churches? My first question. I've got a few questions. What are the churches that God likes? Uh, what are the ones that he, the churches that He's proud of? What are the churches that, if 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 you think that God would, if He was giving them a grade, He would give them top marks? What are the churches that, at the end, God will look at them, Jesus will look at them, and say, "Well done, my good and faithful servants." Enter thou into the kingdom of God. What are those churches? And my answer is this. They are great commission churches or they are churches that are growing. That they're growing in discipleship, they're growing in fellowship, and they're growing in evangelism. If a church is going to get top marks with God, you have to have all three of these things growing within your church. The Great Commission. Just let me read a part of it. It says, and Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and, and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. And in this, I, three, I see the three components. First of all, I see the discipleship com component. Jesus had 12 disciples. He said, go and make disciples. And, and I think that Jesus was sending them out to do something similar to what he'd been doing with his disciples. Could you imagine how his 12 disciples grew over those three years of ministry together? Now, they weren't perfect, but they had grown in their faith. They'd grown in their belief. They had things changing within their lifestyle. If you remember Peter starting off, Peter said, go away from me because I'm just a sinful man. And yet Jesus chose him and brought him in because Jesus knew that even sinful men can grow. Thank God, right? Even sinful women, if there's such a thing, can grow. Talking about sinful women, I just want to do a confession right now for my wife. You notice she's not here. She chose her grandbaby over church this morning. It's, that's, uh, that's, some of you grandparents understand that. But Jennifer came along and Jennifer said, listen, I want to go to Digby and I want to visit 
uh, Colleen's mother and Colleen's family and, and I want to take the baby down. Would you go with me? And she deserted me. <laughs> now, she's coming back today or tomorrow. But <laughs> I want to mention that just in case someone says, where's Colleen today? Well, she's down with Jen and with Lena and down visiting her family because Mike went down, the sinner. Her husband went down to the Wharf Rat Rally. And uh, Brian, also Brian Holmes and Sarah are down there and they're sharing the gospel. Isn't that great? Right, why don't we stop right now and pray for Brian and Sarah. Father, right now we pray for Brian and Sarah, oh God. Lord, and we pray for the believers that are down there at the Wharf Rat Rally. Lord, there's so many people down there that need God. Lord, I pray your hand of grace upon them and you would touch them. Lord, and I pray for Colleen and Jen today as they're at the church there in Tidville, oh Lord. I pray that they just bring a bright light into that church. Father, pray, let them bring encouragement, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples, when they're around Jesus, they found themselves going from sinful men to godly men. They began to grow in their walk with God. Not only, not only did they grow in their discipleship, but they grew in their fellowship. Jesus picked 12 people that... that that in the natural wouldn't get along. Now you think about it. Some of them were fishermen. Some were tax collectors. Simon was one of the, Simon Zelotes was a zealot. A zealot wanted to kill all the tax collectors. How many think that would work right in the church? So he took this mixed match bunch of people that in the natural would not get along, put them together and threw them them fighting and, and uh, arguing allowed them to grow. You know, sometimes we, we mistakenly think that in church we, everything should be smooth all the time. We should always get along. That's, that's not really the reason that Jesus designed church. Fellowship is sometimes we rub one another the wrong way. And through that, like the disciples, we mature in Christ. Sometimes we think church should be paradise, but that's not the New Testament example. It's more like people who are normal people who are struggling in their lives work it out and they grow together in Christ. So in this, in the scripture I see uh, discipleship, I see fellowship with them, with them being together and I also see evangelism because if you look at the Great Commission and you can't see evangelism, you need your eyes checked. Go! and make disciples of all nations. Go everywhere in the world. Go and share the gospel. For us to be a church that has top marks with God, we have to have all three of these, including evangelism. And I'll talk a bit later that if evangelism is missing from our, uh, our, 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 our church, then we are not a true church. What is God's least favorite church? We're talking Christian churches. His top favorite are churches that are growing together, growing in fellowship, discipleship, and evangelism. God's least favorite churches are these. Churches like the church of Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3. Some of you guys knew that. I had Revelation chapter 3 in the reference up there, and some of you guys knew that you talked about the church of Laodicea. If you have your Bibles open, follow along with me says this, to the church, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. In the letters to the seven churches, Jesus always gives this introduction, this, this uh, one verse or two verse introduction, and he describes himself in a, in a great study is just to look through the seven churches and look at the seven descriptions of Christ. Here he's described as the, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the ruler of God's creation. So he is the boss. Verse 15, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were either. Uh, I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich 
I've acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus' least favorite church. His church is like the church of Laodicea. They are the self-satisfied church. The ones that are saying, it says, we do not need a thing. The King James says, I have no, they have no need of anything. That they are absolutely satisfied. The churches that have their nice little building, they have their nice little services, they have their nice little pastor, they have their nice little pews, they can go there on Sunday, they can enjoy their nice little service, and then they can go home at 11 o'clock, and they can live like whatever they'd like to live the rest of the week, so that then when Sunday comes around, they can come and, and, and give their one hour to God and therefore satisfy all the things that God would want them to do by giving one hour a week. How many know that's not the truth? He doesn't want one hour a week. God wants our whole lives. What if you married your spouse and said, listen, I want to marry you, but I'm only going to give you one hour a week. Or well, last longer, right. But uh, <laughs> we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be happy with that. When we get married, we want the whole person. We want their whole heart. We want, we want them. God wants us. He doesn't just want an hour a week or a, here it's an hour and a, hour and a half or depends on how long the pastor preaches. It's, it, he doesn't want an hour and a half a week. He wants all of us. Self-satisfied churches can have this. They can be disciple-making to an extent. Self-satisfied churches actually can be churches that preach the word. And people sit in the pew and say, Amen, pastor, preach it. They may be people in the, the pew that can quote the Bible left, right, and center Bible verses. They may be churches with great fellowship. In fact, probably they are. The latest in church is probably a church that had good, strong preaching and great fellowship. Well, obviously they had lots of money. If you get lots of money, you can buy lots of food. And food makes great fellowship. You can have great discipleship or somewhat great discipleship, somewhat great fellowship, but if evangelism is missing from the ingredients that make your church, your church is a Laodicean church. If it's not reaching out and winning lost people to Jesus Christ, then that church is not getting top marks with God. Someone loan me an amen. We believe in discipleship. Amen? We do a lot for discipleship. Sunday morning, this is about discipleship. Growth groups are about discipleship. Our encounter services are about discipleship. Getting people involved in ministry is about discipleship. I believe we do a lot of things for fellowship. Our coffee house is about Fellowship, And I know there's a discipleship mode in there as well and an evangelism mode, but there's also a fellowship mode because we sit around the table, we sit around with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and some, some delicious things to eat and we spend time with one another. Our yard parties are in some ways about fellowship, aren't they? We sit around with a hamburger and we meet and we mingle and we meet uh, friends and chat with friends. Growth groups are not just about discipleship, but they're also about fellowship because we're getting together with people. Ministry opportunities are not just about discipleship, but you know that one of the best ways to get to know people is to get involved in ministry. If you get involved with a group that's doing something, you'll get a chance to meet people. So we can do discipleship well, we can do fellowship well, but Guys, can I tell you, if we don't do evangelism well, that's the difference between Laodicean churches and Great Commission churches. Are all churches supposed to grow? Next question. Look across North America. 
85% of the churches are either plateaued or shrinking. Our church is really supposed to be growing numerically through evangelism. Not numerically through uh, uh, sheep shifting. How many know what sheep shifting means? Anybody here know that? What sheep shifting mean? Uh, there you go, jumping from church to church the, that uh, there's a problem over at the, the church next door and we get a few sheep. And there's a problem over at that church over there and we get a few more sheep. We're not talking about sheep shifting. We're talking about evangelism, seeing people come to Christ. Church hopping? Yep, yep. You could call it that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll toss in this. There's times that we, we shift churches. I have to confess, I have shifted churches. I shifted to come here four and a half, almost five years ago. So sometimes we do shift churches. But if that's the way you're growing your church is by stealing someone else's sheep, that's not really the type of growth that God desires. Amen? He desires growth through evangelism. Does God really want the church to grow? Mark chapter 4. Uh, the references are up there. Mark chapter 4 says this. Again he said, What shall we say? The kingdom of God is like... Uh, let, me, let me start this again. This is Jesus speaking. I'm reading what Jesus wrote and said. Again he said, What shall I say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. What is the kingdom of God like? What should churches be like? What is an example of what a church should look like? He says it's like this. It's a small seed and you put it in the ground and it grows and it grows to be something big the early church applied this principle and by the time the early church was 300 years, 300 years old do you realize that they had won 50 percent of the Roman Empire in 300 years 50% of the Roman Empire was Christian within 300 years. We could talk about their methods, but I, I just want to mention that. Do you realize that Christianity across this world is the largest creature on earth? It's the largest group of people that are associated with one another. Somewhere between 35 to 40% of the world call themselves Christian. How many knew that? Did you know this? In China and or Latin America, they estimate that there are 30,000 people born again every day. So if you go to China, it's 30,000 a day. If you go to Latin America, they're just about matching China at 30,000 a day. That means in 10 days in China or in Latin America, if you go to either one of those locations, in 10 days they have... 300 people that are born again. 300,000 people that are born again. If you were to stay there 10, uh, if you were to stay there 100 days, they would have 3 million people being born again in those locations. If you stay there for a year, you'd have over 10 million people born again in either one of these two locations. God's plan is for the church to grow. That's His will. That is, that is his design. He's designed this thing to grow. God expects his kingdom to be like that mustard seed that is growing and blessing the world and touching the world. Congregations, there's a lot of them that are not growing. In fact, there's a lot that are dying. How many knew this, that we now do funerals for churches? Anybody knew that? We do funerals for churches. A couple of weeks ago, we did a funeral for one of our churches. We call it a, a, a closing ceremony. So what you do in a funeral for a church is, is you go there and there's only half a dozen people left. 
maybe a dozen. The finances have dried up. They can't afford to pay the bills because they haven't done evangelism for decades. No one gets saved and the old people have died away. So there's not enough to keep it open. Then the district has the great job to go in and tell them that. And so we do a celebration at the end. We invite former members, former pastors, and the few that's left to come, and we talk about the stories of the past, of all the things that God has done. Have a closing prayer and lock the doors. I'm talking with the superintendent, we have 12 churches right now out of our 67, we used to say 68, but now it's down to 67. Out of our 67 churches, we have 12 that are, they're beyond intensive care. They are dying. And there's one reason a church dies. Because they don't do evangelism. Because if a church does evangelism at least a little well, the church will grow. Because I believe God designed churches to grow. Let me ask you another question. Who builds the church? Come on, answer me. Who builds the church? Jesus said, in my, let me just fix this. It's kind of flipping around a little bit. There we go. Jesus said what? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we can answer that very clearly from Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 that Jesus builds the church and say a great amen to that. Jesus builds the church. Amen? Amen. So let me ask you this, if Jesus is building the church, why is 85% of our churches in decline or dying? What's the answer to that? Yeah, it's people, that's, that's, that's the reason. Here's, let me give you another scripture. This will clarify this thought of how God builds the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you're going to open to a scripture, open to this one with me follow along with it because it's important for us to really grasp this thought of how the kingdom of God grows. Paul here in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians is dealing with some fighting within the church because they're like us. They have problems. We have problems. If you get people, you get problems. The more people you have, the more problems you have. God sends us more problems. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 says this. He says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has made it grow. God has given the increase. I planted, Apollos watered, and God made it grow. In, in this church, I, th I see three hands working. I see Paul working, I see Apollos working, and I see a hand over top of them all. It's God working. Verse 7. So, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. None of us get any glory. None of us get the, 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 the glory for, for seeing anything grow because it's God that makes it grow. It's God that builds the church. But He expects us to plant it. He expects us to water it. Do you get in the picture here? We plant... We water, and God makes it grow. So who builds the church? God builds the church. Who plants the seeds? It's us that plants the seeds. Who waters the seeds? It's us that water the seeds. But it's God that grows the church. Verse 8. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. and they will each be rewarded according to their labors. Verse 9, note this, for we are co-workers in God's service. For we are co-workers in God's service. We are planting, we are watering, we are 
hoeing, we are tilling, we are doing all the things to try to see people come into the kingdom, but it's God that makes them grow. It God, it's God's spirit that pulls them. It's God's spirit that comes into their lives. So it's all of God, yet we are called to work beside him. We are called to be his co-workers. It goes on and says, you are God's field, God's building. Amplified, I've got this up in the Amplified, and look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Amplified says, For we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. That's how it grows. It's when we say that we're going to work with God. We're going to be fellow workers. We're going to be joint promoters. We're going to be co-laborers. We're going to be laboring together with and for God for the purpose of evangelism. That's when the church grows because God is always ready to grow the church. He is always willing to grow the church, but churches die because people stop working with God. That's the difference between a Great Commission church and a Laodicean church if people are saying, I'm going to work with God and make this thing grow. An evangel, we are growing together. God, help us to make this thing grow. Paul goes on in verse 10, if you still have your Bibles open to chapter 3 of of 1 Corinthians, he says, says, "By by the grace God has given me, I lay a foundation as a wise builder. And if there's a definition I'd like to have in my, uh, in, my, uh, in my office, it's that thought that I'm a wise builder. I'm laying the right foundation so this thing can grow. I'm laying the right foundation. I'm working with the right people so that we can make this thing grow. Why? Because we're after numbers. No, we're after souls. We want to see people saved. We want to see people come to Christ. If all we have is good fellowship, folks, go down to the country club. If all we have is good discipleship, just do it on the internet. Folks, we want fellowship, we want discipleship, we want evangelism. That's where this bus wants to go, because that's where God wants to take this bus. Evangel needs to be about not just discipleship and fellowship, but about evangelism. If our church is not growing, who, if our church is not growing, whose fault is it? It is not God's fault. If this church doesn't grow, I'll tell you where it starts. It's right here, the guy that's standing behind the pulpit. And it's going to go right over to the guy in the pretty purple shirt over here. Our children's pastor, our secretary, our board, and everyone in here. If this church doesn't grow, there's only one group to blame, and that's us. Because it's not God's fault, because it is God's will that this place grow. How do we grow the church? If if evangel is not about growth, if we are not about evangelism, along with growing in discipleship, along with growing in fellowship, if we are not about evangelism, guys, we are in the wrong building. We need to find a place that we can do it in. Every one of us, it should be about discipleship, fellowship, and evangelism. Amen? Five things I want to see the church doing for evangelism. Can I give you five? I could give you more. Uh, let's, settle, let's settle with five. Five things that need to take place for evangelism. Number one is prayer. I'm in negotiations with Alan Baker to come up and spend another week with us in prayer. How many remember the week of prayer we had with Alan Baker? We had some prayer going on. We, we basically prayed from nine in the morning to five in the afternoon, took a little break, then come back in and, and had an evening of teaching. And uh, we're planning on something like that in the fall because I believe that we need to pray. And I believe we need to increase our prayer within this church. We really do. Prayer shows us certain things. Number one, it shows us whether we're dependent upon God or not. 
And I don't think that we're nearly as dependent upon God as we should be. Prayer tells us a lot of things about us. If you listen to a person's prayer, you can tell several things about that person. Number one, you can tell what's important to that person when you listen to them pray. Because if you could go and ask God for anything, you're going to ask for the things that are most important to you. Does that make sense? Our prayers tell us a lot about who we are. It tells us a lot about what we think God's priorities are. If you ever noticed your prayers, you watch this. Because you'll go to God and you'll talk to Him about what's important to Him as well. Prayer also tells us this. It tells us what we're afraid of. Because it's what's intimidating to us is what we'll take to God as well. Your prayers tell a lot about who you are. Here's a problem we have. We spend more time praying about keeping people out of heaven than we do about praying for people to get into heaven. Let me explain myself. Put the stones down. We spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven. We pray for people who are sick, who are struggling, who are going through difficult times, we pray for God to heal them, to rescue them, to save them, protect them. Then we spend praying for souls. Why? Now, we need to pray for sick people. Absolutely. We need to pray for protection. We need to pray for health. We need to pray for safety. I'm not saying don't pray for those things, but if that's all you pray for, what does it tell me? That you're scared, you're afraid of sickness. It tells me the most important thing to you is your health. And it tells me that you think that God is more concerned about people's feelings and how they feel than, they, than God is concerned about their eternal soul. Can I, can I give you something that you can remember that Pastor Crockett said this? Everyone's going to die. And we'll probably all die because of sickness. Now, there may be a few that are, 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 are die by a strike of lightning, but most of us will die because we get sick. Heart attack, cancer will probably take most of us. But what happens after our death is really what is important to God. We should pray for sick people. Well, absolutely. But if all we pray for is sick people and miss the thought that we need to be interceding for lost people to come to Christ, folks, our prayer is more about us than it is about the heart of God. We need to pray that God would send workers into His field, that God would send His, His Spirit to touch people's lives, that God would send us out and enable us to be witnesses. Prayer should not just be about the sick. It should be about the sick, but it should also be about souls. We should be praying that people will not get, just get out of the hospital, but they would be going to heaven. We need to be praying for souls. Our prayer life needs to be reshifted a little bit. And we need to intercede for the lost. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Folks, we need to take on some of those gates of hell. We need to, to empty hell. We need to attack hell. We need to steal souls from hell. We need to pull them out of hell and bring them into the kingdom of God. Folks, if we're not doing that in our prayer lives, if that's not the direction of our prayer life, then our prayer life is a little off track and needs to have a, just a small shift. Please hear me. I pray for sick people. I pray for sick people every week. I pray for struggling people every week. But I don't pray nearly enough for lost souls. How about you? We, me, us, we need to be praying more for lost souls. Number two. Five strategies for church growth. Five things that will drive church growth. 
Number two, Sunday morning worship. Sunday morning worship, Sunday mornings are not just about us. They're about bringing people along with us to know Christ. That you can invite people to come and join us. So they'll hear the gospel. We've done a lot to improve our Sunday mornings over the last four and a half years. Amen? How many like our pews? You know what? Those chairs aren't just for you. They're for you. But they're for people to come in as well. Amen? So what I'm saying here is Sunday morning is not just about us. These pews are nice. I can preach longer. But they're also for... Some wish they had the blue chairs again. But they're also... <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <laughs> but they're also to bring people in. We, we uh, paved the parking lot, but the paved parking lot is not just for us, amen? It's because we want people, when they come to the church for their first time, they drive in, they've got a nice place to park that's marked out with lines, and people park on the little spot now, and, and it's, there's, there's nice. And you know what? As soon as that parking lot gets filled, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, can we get a few folks that that are members of this church that can park over on the gravel so we'll give room for people who are coming as first time guests to have a nice place to park because that parking lot is not just to make us comfy it's because we want to see people come to this church we painted this room why? for us? yes but it's for the lost we did the platform why? for us? yes but it's to reach the lost we want a nice place to invite people to we did new projectors why? because we want to do projectors? Yes. But it's so we can give a proper presentation to win the loss. We need a new sound system. Why? Because for us, yes. Because we like it to sound nice. But it's also so we can reach the loss. Sunday morning is not just about us. It's designed. All the thoughts, all the things we've done. It's so that we can reach more people for Christ. Sunday morning is the most important day of the week. Service of the week. Point of the week for church growth. You need to bring people, invite people to join us for Sunday mornings. The third most important thing for a strategy for, for church growth is what is referred to as our assimilation system. It's how we treat first time guests. We are Borg you will be assimilated. <laughs> I've talked a bit about this. There's our book that we use, Fusion by Nelson Searcy. I've flashed that a few times. If you want to know what we do, read the book. And the only thing you see about the assimilation system is this. You'll see a little card. We call it a communication card. It's designed to help us to take attendance of who's here, help us to gather prayer requests, Help us to get feedback in the congregation. And let's help us to know who's our first-time guests. And people who are first-time guests that fill that out and put their address on, if we have any first-time guests today, <coughs> if they fill that out and put their address on it, I'll write them a nice little letter early in the week. And I'll put a $5 Tim's card inside of that letter, and I'll tell them that I appreciate them being here because we do appreciate them because we do value them. And we'll slip that in the mail and send it off to them. If they sent me my, their email address on that communication card, guess what? I'll type them up an email and say, it was really nice to have you here. Really enjoyed having you here. Do you have any questions? Because we'd love to answer them. Do you have any prayer needs? Do you have anything we can do for you? Let us know. And, and I've started up email conversations with people that they just we're trying to get contact with them. And then we try to get them involved as quickly as we can in this, the church. And if you're not involved, wait, I'm not finished. We try to get them involved as quickly as we can because we want this church to be their church, not just our church. We want this not to be some sort of a closed group. We want this to be an open group where people can come and they're here the first time we can find something for them to do, to get involved. 
we do that. Jeremy's our second time here. Jeremy's on the sign-up for, yard, for the, uh, the big uh, fall party, the kickoff. He's on the sign-up. Why? He didn't have to come for six months. We signed him up the first day. Why? Because we want people involved in this church. If you're here, we want to get you involved. We want you to feel a part of it because that's family, that's discipleship, that's assimilation. That's a part of evangelism. Let me give you a name. Paul Borden. Paul Borden was the, um, the, uh, the guy that did the seminar I mentioned earlier that I went to. Paul Borden is, is uh, uh, I use Nelson Searcy systems because you got to have some sort of system to, 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 to do everything. But Paul Borden in the U.S. is the guy that turns churches around. He is the man. He's 70 years old. He's an old guy now. But uh, he is the man that's turned churches around. He is known for the guru of how to turn a church that is dying because they're missing one thing, evangelism. They're dying, and he's been the guy that's turned around church after church after church. He gave three things. I give five things. He gave three things to grow a church. He said Sunday morning, assimilation, children's ministry that's the three top things I get five because I think prayers are number one thing my number four thing is big events children's ministry I have as number five big, big events the church cannot grow without them when I say big events what am I talking about I am not talking about having a Christian concert Folks, that is not what I mean when I say we need big events. Ignite is the book. If you want to know how this works, what we're doing, read the book Ignite. If you want a copy of it, Amazon has it. If you can't find it on Amazon, talk to me. And I probably may have a free one laying around. It talks about doing big events. And I'm, talk, I'm, not, I'm not talking about having a Christian comedian come in either. I'm not talking about having Joyce Myers or, or, or some great speaker come in. That is not what I'm talking about when I say a big event. A big event is this. It's something that is designed for the community, and we design three of them a year, Easter, the fall kickoff, and Christmas. The fall kickoff, let me talk about it, because we still need more volunteers. The fall kickoff, 500, or sorry, 5,000 invitations. John and his team has given some out at the uh, parade at Eastern Passage. There's more going to be given out at uh, Colt. Harbor Parade, the best invitation is you giving it to someone you know and inviting them to come. That is by far the best way of inviting. Can I encourage you? This is how we do evangelism. It's, we try to make it as easy as possible, as convenient as possible, so we do off nice little cards and all you've got to do is say, oh, you got kids? Here. You guys like pony rides? Hey, kids, you like pony rides? Take that. Because there's bouncy castles and there's pony rides and there's cotton candy and there's burgers and there's petting zoos and, and games and prizes and bikes and all this given away. But folks, why do we do it? Can I tell you the method that we're working? This is our system for evangelism. We do a big event that everybody can bring a friend to. And folks, it's not about the ponies, it's not about the barbecue, it's not about the, the bouncy castles. You know what it's about? It's about a little meeting that we'll have somewhere through that, that we'll bring people into this room. Because we've got all the people out, our target is people with kids. And we'll have a sign up. And we'll try to get them signed up for Sunday school and for our children's program, which we're going to run Sunday nights. We'll sign people up for our programs. We want to have them come back a second time. If they leave here with a full belly, we've missed it. We have to get them back again because we want to do the process of evangelizing them. We'll present them with the gospel and they'll have a chance that night to receive Jesus Christ. But our goal is to get them back a second time. And then after that, we're going to be doing a, 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 um, a parenting conference. 
So we want to get them back a third time. Here's the thought. Guys, all you guys, when you went out with your first date with the woman you married, by the end of that first date, what were you thinking about? Who said that? Thank you for one good-hearted person because I know what some of you were thinking about. You wonder whether you can get a chance to kiss the girl. But it wasn't that. You were thinking about, should, should I ask her out for a second date? Will she go out with me again? And folks, our yard party is this. We get them in for a first date and then we ask them right away for a second date. Now, you girls, if... If your husband, who your present husband, invited you out for the first date, and he did invite you out for another date for three months, what would you think? Nah, I'm not going out with him. There's no interest. He checked me out, and he's been out three months checking somebody else out. I'm not going there. When we get people out, our goal is we get them here. Big event is the first date. And we try to get them out to a second event that's attractive to them. Why? Because we want to get them back to our property again. Because we want to see them become a part of who we are. Evangelism. They come in. And, and we've seen people come in through our coffee house. And then they move to Sunday morning. And then they get saved. And then they get water baptized. And then they get members of the church and they, they begin to grow. But the big event, evangelism, is designed to get people here the first time. And then we bait them up to try to get them here a second time. Guys, that is our secret. It is out. Why? Because we want to see this church grow. We want to do evangelism. We want to see people come to Christ. How many think that's pretty easy to do? This method isn't hard. But this is what we're doing. We're trying to get people here. And we can't get them here unless you help. You have to help by inviting. And then you have to volunteer. John's going to be outside with a clipboard. You have to volunteer to help barbecue. And help watch the bouncy castle. And help watch the pony rides. And help do everything else that needs to be done. It's a very simple way of doing evangelism. I think everyone can do this. The fourth thing you have to have in place for churches to grow is a good children's ministry. Paul Borden said this, number three. For good children's ministry, you need the right person. Folks, we've got that. Amen? We have Tracy. Tracy is the person. She is the one that God has chosen for us. She comes with years of experience, all kinds of it. She's been successful in ministry now for how many years? 12 years, 15 years? She was 16 or 17 years. She has been successful in ministry. The second thing Paul Borden says you need is a room that screams we love kids. Does that scream children's ministry or does that scream seniors ministry? That screams to me children's ministry, and, and uh, they've got the carpet laid, uh, Esau was in, they've got some more going together, and hopefully within the end of the week, it will be completed. Here's the thing, 1950s, roll the time clock back a bit, 1950s, kids follow their parents to church. Today, parents follow their kids to church. If you can pull the child in and see that little kid come in and see them come to Christ, their parents will follow them. For an example of this, is think of about a soccer field where there's a bunch of kids playing. If there's a bunch of kids playing in the soccer field, who's circled around them? Their parents. Why? Because they drove them there and they had to hang out and watch their kids until the thing was over to pick them up and bring them up. Parents hover around wherever their kids are because they're watching them. They want to make sure they're safe. They want to see them doing things. If you have a good children's ministry, you'll have parents coming in. Today, that's one of the ways you do evangelism. I think 
by the addition of this children's ministry, this church, Evangel, is set for growth. Amen? Our choice is this. Our choice is this. We can be a good church with discipleship. We can be a good church with fellowship. And stop. And if we stop there, they will do a funeral for this church in a few years. It may be a decade, it may be two decades. But I believe that we need fellowship, we need discipleship, and we need evangelism. For evangelism to take place, we need your help. For us not to be a Laodicean church, we need your help. And here is my invitation. At the end of the service, John is going to be out there. We need people to do the burgers, the cotton candy, three barbecues, slushy machine, corn on the cob. For that event, do you know we need about ten people in that one area to volunteer? We need a lot of people to volunteer. We need you to volunteer. You don't have to be good at it. But we need volunteers. We need people who will be ready if we need more burgers to say, Yikes, go to Sobeys, quick. And we'll get them out of here in case we go from 200 to, to 300 right away and buy all of Sobeys hamburgers and come back. We need people doing all these different things in order for us to have an event that's going to attract people. Folks, this big event is the biggest event that we've had since I've been here. If the church is going to grow, next week is the day. If we're going to attract new families to the church, next week is the day. Because it's the beginning of our children's ministry. It's a sign up for a children's ministry. Is there any other way I could stress how important next week is to us? How many want Evangel to grow? How many will help us? Come on, put your hand up again. How many will help us? Mikey, Mikey, get your hand up. You want to help us? There you go. Thank you. Anyway, get your hand up. Slip your hand up again. You're going to help us. Give out invitations. Pray. Invite. Be a part of the crazy hat parade. And be a part of our big day. John's going to be outside. He's going to be there to sign up people because children's ministry, we still need more helpers. We want to run a Sunday night same as time as coffee house so people will bring their kids to a Sunday night. They'll slip in here for a coffee house and we can give them the gospel. I think that's a good idea. Absolutely. Get them here for the kids. Okay? Get the kids here. Long range forecast. Pray for sunshine. And, and pray that God will send in a whole lot of people that we'll have a great time and a great ministry here. I would pause for questions, but I've gone way over. But folks, that's where this bus is going. How many want to be a part of this bus? Amen. Most of us. Because we want to do evangelism. We want to do it well. Stand with me. We want to see souls saved.